thanks for everybody for coming. Welcome to Pro Writing Aid 101. This is where we get you started and up and running on Pro Writing Aid. And we bring Chris Banks, who is the brainchild behind all of these different things. And we um, get him to show you all of his favorite parts and talk about how Pro Writing Aid came to be. Um, so just some boring things before we begin. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a couple different buttons. Um, the Q&A button is the best one to push if you've got a specific question for me and uh, Chris to cover. Um, this is going to be our general agenda that we're going to be going through over the course of the next hour. Um, but if you have specific questions, we tend to be guided by all of you. So if there's specific um, integrations you want us to look at, if there's specific reports you want us to talk about, then that's fine. Otherwise, we'll sort of cover this agenda as we go. Um, I just wanted to introduce Chris. He's here. He's going to appear out of the ether in a second. There he is. Uh, so Chris created the very first version of ProWriting Aid back when he was working on his own book in, what, 2014 now? Something like that. Yeah. Seems like a long, long time ago now. I know. Well, and luckily for all of us, he um, fell skiing and broke his ankle and was stuck in bed for ages. And that's when he started tinkering around with the idea that he could use software to edit his book. Um, and it was the beginning of this like crazy obsession for Chris Banks. And he's now spends all of his time and energy um, trying to find ways to use software to help writers develop their style, their skills, their technique. Um, so Chris, we're glad you're here. Well, all of the time I'm not looking after a baby I spend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the time he used to spend working on his own books, he's got at least three fiction novels on the go. But now he's got a tiny baby, so that's taken up some of his writing time. Is that true? Yeah. Is there any time in life for two things? Writing and babies? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, so what we normally do is we just get Chris to open up the web editor. That al Almost all of our different integrations have the same general functionality. Um, Chris, can you? Yeah, you can share. Um, so he's going to talk us through sort of the first things you want to do to get up and running and get started, um, and then we'll, we'll we'll go from there. So this Thanks is what you'll see when you first start up. Where where do they begin? Yes. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so yeah, this is the, our web editor, as Lisa said. Uh, I'm going to use the web editor because a lot of people use that, but we also have integrations for uh, Google Docs, Microsoft Word. Um, Outlook as well. Uh, we have a desktop app that works with Scrivener, which is a really great application for anybody who's doing longer writing. Um, we've got browser extensions for all of the, the most common browsers as well. Uh, so you can really use ProWritingAid wherever you're writing. And that's part of our philosophy is that you know, we don't want to force you to use an editor or a writing environment that you're not used to. Uh, we want to try and integrate wherever we can. So wherever we have been able to, sometimes it's not technically possible, um, we've tried to do that. Um, but I'm going to use the web editor because it, it looks very similar to all of the others. And we try and keep the, the interface similar so that people uh, you know, can change between different environments. So if you're writing a, you know, a, a blog post on Medium uh, one day and then you're working on your novel the next day, then you will see something very similar, whether you're using the desktop app or the web editor or the browser extension. Yeah. That said, there may be a couple of things that you see today. We've just released a few cool, exciting new features. So you may see a few things here in the web editor today with Chris yeah. that you may not see in a couple of the other integrations. Um, and because we always we usually start by rolling them out here and then they, um, they get added to the different integrations as we go along. Yeah, I think it's important to know we're always kind of improving the tool and uh, experimenting and seeing what works for people um, to make sure that, that you get the, the, the tool that really works for you. Um, so yeah, as Lisa said, we've been rolling out some improvements uh, recently, which uh, are aimed at giving you uh, a more, an easier path to, to writing success. Uh, so for most people, I think the first thing that they uh, want to do is to upload a document uh, or to get an existing document into the web editor. Um, most people's natural inclination might be to copy and paste from wherever you've been writing into the web editor. 
Um, we generally advise you not to do that. Uh, and the reason being that whenever you copy from uh, a writing environment and you paste it into a browser, there'll be some loss uh, of formatting uh, just because browsers support different fonts and, and various other things. There might be issues with footnotes, etc. cetera. Um, so the best way to do it is to actually click on this upload a document uh, and that will upload your document. And, and what we do is we show you the document without the formatting and you can make your changes. And then when you finish, you just download the document again and we just apply the changes to your original document, maintaining all of your formatting and anything else you have, footnotes, headers, footers, whatever, uh, should all uh, be unaffected. Um, you can also do that from the main menu, right? Do you want to show them that? Yeah, uh, <laughs> and so it will save you an awful lot of time. Uh, I know in some other tools, uh, you have to copy and paste and, and it can cause a huge amount of pain at the end when you then have to go through and reapply all of your formatting. Um, you can just do an upload here or an, and then when you want it again, you export it here. So uh, I just clicked on this menu item here. And uh, so if I click upload, and I go to my desktop and choose sample text. Uh, it will load up the sample text in here and you can see straight away uh, things start going. Uh, and you can see I've got highlights in here. Um, I've got blue ones, I've got yellow ones. Uh, I would have red ones, I, yeah, red ones. Uh, and you'll also get purple ones. Uh, so blue is your grammar mistakes, uh, red is any spelling mistakes, and uh, the yellow are style suggestions. And then we also have purple, which is passive voice. Um, but I don't have any passive voice in this document. Um, if you <laughs> and hover... if you still haven't fixed, um, in the third line there, it's the word before is misspelled. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Chris, at one point- I added it to my dictionary, this. I keep forgetting to take it out again. Yeah, <laughs> added it to the dictionary. So it's not flagged anymore, which is, and adding things to the dictionary is a great feature. If you have, if you're writing sci-fi, for example, and the name of your planet is whatever, you can add it in. And <clears throat> once you've added that as a, to your dictionary, it won't be flagged as a misspell, misspelling anymore. That's good if you've got lots of strange character names, or if you work in an industry that has, um, you know, specific brand names, that sort of thing. Um, so- Have you made up languages? You made up languages, which yeah. we see a lot. Um, yeah, so each user will have their own um, dictionary that they can build and create and use um, around whatever they happen to be writing. Yeah, uh, and you can see, so on uh, every suggestion, you can hover over it and then you'll see a description of the suggestion. You can accept it by just clicking. In this case, it's deleting it. Uh, you can disable the rule. In some cases, you might decide, oh no, I don't. We care about this rule and uh, disabling it will then just uh, mean that you never have to think about it again. Uh, and then you have ignore, which means just ignore this uh, instance of it. Um, also, you have this I button, which is very important uh, because if you don't really understand what we're saying in this, you can click on here and you can get a lot more information. So, what we try and do is we try to explain exactly why we give our recommendations as well. So the idea is that as you're going through and you're working on your document, you're actually also learning. And what we've did, done is taken all of the advice that you see in books about how to improve your style or how to write better, and we've turned them into articles that we've then added to our rules. So instead of having to read all of those books and then remember it all so that you can apply it to your writing, uh, you can actually access it as you are working and so you're much more likely to remember it uh, and you'll always see it and if you've forgotten that then you can just give yourself a quick refresh um, and every article uh, we mix in uh, video as well uh, to a lot of them because uh, it's a lot easier to remember things that you've seen in, the, in, in a clear visual image um, so you get a lot of resources here um, and there's also a link to go to our um, our blog as well. Uh, so every article has a read full article link as well, which will take you to our blog, which is, again is full of resources 
um, to help you improve your writing because that's at the end of the day what we're trying to do. There's over a thousand articles there are now sort of based around the rules that you'll come across in the software. Some of them are created by, you know, actual copy editors who, as they're editing their work, they realize with that example there that, that writing the word very in front of um, slowly doesn't actually give any more punch to the word slowly. And it, it, sometimes it can actually make it l feel less intense. Um, and that's the kind of thing that newer writers, you know, that haven't taken a lot of writing training may not know. They, they may think that adding the word very gives it a bit more punch. Um, but editors, you know, see this all the time. And so the idea is instead of just saying, no, get rid of this, there's a good explanation there. And then as you go along, the more you edit, the more you learn. And then you'll be less likely to try and give give your words power by adding a very you'll instead you'll find a more powerful verb find a way to to show things that just has a bit more punch instead of just depending on intensifiers like that so there's thousands of rules like that all the way through it um, as you go along yeah exactly and the the advice that you get is then what your copy editor would tell you so the tool is designed to be used you know, on less important documents like emails, right? It just gives you uh, an, an extra set of eyes to make sure that you haven't made any mistakes and to suggest some uh, nice, easy improvements, the kind of things that copy editors would always suggest. Um, and if you want, if you're writing something that's a, a more high value document, a novel or a business plan or, or something that you, you really want to have an impact on the reader, um, then you can go a lot deeper. Um, so it works, the tool works on, on both those levels. It, you can get quick fixes and quick improvements, or you can really go deep and, and learn and improve your document to you know, a professional level. Uh, um, so, yeah. So I'm just going to say, Sherry has asked if we've got YouTube how-to videos um, that help people through some of these things. So I'm just going to drop the link in the chat right now to our YouTube channel. Um, it has... I'm, I'm adding a playlist that has 32 videos. That's everything about all the different reports and how to use, how to get started. I think there's a how to get started on Scrivener one, how to manage your team, um, all, all kinds of things in there. So have a look um, if the, when, when you're ready to go a bit deeper in specific elements or specific reports. Yeah, and uh, so it's interesting to point out as well that we allow you to uh, set specific document types. So there's uh, settings up here uh, and the settings will determine uh, the feedback you're getting. So obviously for a lot of people, the important thing is what version of English they're gonna be using. Uh, we support variety. Um, then you've got your writing style, but we even give you specific feedback on specific document types. Um, so what, we, what we're trying to do with the feedback is we try to benchmark your writing against great writers in your genre. Right? So we've taken samples of, of you know, either published writing or, or great examples from different genres. Uh, and then we've analyzed them using our algorithms. Uh, and then we show you how you compare to those documents. So depending on what document type you choose, uh, your feedback will vary slightly. So a good example would be you know, if you're writing a romance novel, then your sentences will generally be, generally be a lot shorter than if you're writing, you know, a popular science non-fiction book or, um, you know, something that's more technical. Uh, and you'll get all of the feedback uh, down the side here. So the idea is these are your, your goals and they give you uh, benchmarks to aim for. Um, so if you can see this is set currently to being an academic essay. Um, the things in here will change depending on what you've set it to. Uh, so, for instance, transitions, which is how you're linking together sentences, are really important for essays for structuring your argument. Uh, so we show you how many transitions that you're using, uh, and then we give you a suggestion of what a good essay would look like. So you can see this isn't a great example because this is a creative writing piece uh, instead of an essay, actually. Um, but it's got 2% transitions and we suggest over 25%. Uh, so what I'll actually do is I will change it to a more relevant genre. So you can see we've got uh, academic, business, technical and creative. Uh, so I think this is more of a historical fiction. Uh, so I'll set historical fiction 
and you'll see that the goals recalculate my transitions have gone uh, and then I've got new goals around things like sentence length, uh, the readability grades, sentence variety. And again, if I don't understand any of these things, um, then I can click on the information icon and you'll get a nice article that explains uh, what the goal is about and how you can achieve it. So the idea is that we're giving you a clear path to uh, a great document. Um, if you get your goal score up to 100%, uh, then it will be in line with uh, other documents. Uh, yeah, and again, and this, this is, oh, sorry. Sorry. I, I was just gonna say that um, this came like really directly out of um, feedback from our community because one of the things that people told us is that, especially with long form writing, they'd write a whole essay or they'd write a whole book or they'd write a whole novel and they'd get to the end and then not really know where to begin with editing. They just, it just felt like big and 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 difficult and, and, and a bit overwhelming. And so our whole idea with all of these goals is to help people break the editing process down into easy bite-sized goals. And so maybe you spend one day just looking at, at all of your really long sentences to make sure that they're clear and easy to follow and maybe breaking them into two where possible. You know, and then the next day you go through and you look at all of your emotional tells if you're writing a romance. Are there times when you've said that that she felt the love when you could have shown it through something that she's done, for example? Um, and the idea is it sets a roadmap for you to do an edit so that you can feel your progress and it doesn't feel quite as daunting. Yes, exactly. Uh, and it gives you, yeah, it gives you a clear indication. These are ordered in terms of really the importance uh, so if you again you know everybody in the world has got a limited amount of time uh, so you might have a limited amount of time to invest in your document so if you just want to get the most out of the time that you have then start at the top and work your way down and uh, so you can see you know obviously i think that things like spelling and grammar are the most important uh, this document does pretty well on a lot of these goals uh, there's a glue index of 46%, which is uh, probably too high. Um, this will then take me to the sticky sentences report, uh, which looks at glue index. And actually, you can just click on this and it will run it. Um, but I'll actually sticky start. Sticky sentences is my favorite report. Yeah, I think it's uh, is for a lot of people. <laughs> it's a surprisingly uh, addictive report, I think. Um, do you quick? Do you want to just show quickly the pop up? How okay? So there's two questions that are coming in actually from what you've talked about. So do you want to show in the pop up how you can move straight on to the next suggestion? Uh, yeah. So if I uh, have the pop up open, then I can just click here, or in the right hand column you'll see uh, this little arrow uh, and accept suggestion and move next. Uh, so if I accept that and move to the next one, then it will just move straight away to the next one. It's a uh, so great, really efficient way to just move through your document. Ignore and move it. next as well. Um, or if you prefer, you can you have a list of all of the improvements here as well. Uh, so you can easily just work your way through uh, these and say, okay, uh, yep, yeah, that looks good. Yeah. So at the top of that left, so the left hand column, some of you that are on, uh, I've got somebody who's saying they're not seeing the left hand column in desktop yet, and that's true, they will. What's the rollout time for um, goals in the side column? Uh, hopefully in the next uh, two or three weeks. Okay, great. So currently you can find these goals. So on the top of the left hand column there, um, it says either goals or improvements. And goals are all of your scores, your percentages, what you're looking for, and improvements are the specific changes. So you can switch between those two and see where you're at. Currently in the desktop, you can see those goals in the summary report. Yep. Um, but we found that we were going back and forth. It's, it's slightly trickier to go back and forth between the summary report and the actual reports themselves. So we've just made it so that all of that information will be right there in your sidebar as you're going through them. Um, and I've got a couple of questions about um, the the dictionary. How do people add words to the dictionary? Uh, you can either uh, click on a word. So when you've got a um, misspelling, then there's a add to dictionary button. That's the easiest one and how most people will do it. I'm not going to add that because otherwise. 
Uh, or you can go to the menu here and there's a edit my dictionary button here, which will then open it up and you can edit. And that's where you can take words out of the dictionary as well? Yep. Okay, great. So I'll uh, show the summary report next, I think. You That's why I always tell people to start. It just points you in the right direction and helps you set a course. Yeah, this is, I think, it's always best to, to plan your strategy of improving a document before you start, um, because it gives you a clear indication of what you want to achieve. And I think that's what the benefit of the summary report is. It gives you a, an overview of your document um, and you can plan how what you're going to target to improve. Um, as I said, you know, you've only got a limited amount of time. What we try and do is point you to the areas of your document that will get the most benefit from your attention uh, and where you can make the biggest improvements. Uh, we want you to um, make the most of your time and we want to save you as much time as possible. Uh, and that's the, the main aim of the tool. You know, a lot of these things you could do manually, but it will just take you a huge amount of time. Um, you know, so, for instance, you could go through and, and find every instance of the passive voice in your document and rewrite it into the active. Um, you know, it would mean you'd have to rewrite, well, read your whole novel through, which is obviously going to take a long time, uh, and then find every passive voice and then change it. Uh, whereas we'll just highlight them all and you can then, and often we'll give you a suggestion of how you can rewrite it as well. So this is the summary report. So you can see very similar, the, the goal scores here um, broken down into uh, ones that have achieved and not achieved. Um, and then you get uh, a section for each of the goals that goes into more details. So you can see uh, your grammar mistakes, for instance. Um, what we also do is we uh, show you uh, benchmarks against uh, great writers in your genre. Uh, so for instance here uh, for my emotion told i can see a breakdown against the average for historical fiction and the average for stephen king um, it's chosen stephen king because this guy specified him as my favorite author um, you can change your favorite author and we have I don't know, it must be over 50 authors in there now uh, so you can find your your favorite one and, and set that the comparison um, how did they do that? Mm -hmm. uh, it's in the settings. How did people choose their author? In the settings, yes. So again, I'll you click on the settings bit on the toolbar and there's a um, settings button uh, and you can choose that. Uh, so you can see, for instance, everything in your writing compared to uh, published authors or and to the average in, in the genre that you've chosen. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we, you know, we've taken hundreds of documents uh, for each genre and then we've used those uh, as a benchmark. Uh, so the idea is that you can see exactly where your writing is doing well and, and where it's not doing so well um, so that you know really where to focus. And I think that for me, that's one of the problems when you're trying to improve a piece of writing uh, or trying to improve as a writer is that it's often not easy to see why a piece of writing isn't working um, you know, and the skills that you need to learn as a writer to improve are not as obvious as they would be of you know another skill right I, I always use tennis as an example right in tennis you have your forehand and your backhand and your serve and your volleying right and so it's obvious you know one of those is weak so you have to focus on it uh, whereas in writing, there's so many different skills, you know, things like sentence variation, adverb usage, uh, uh, sticky sentences, you know, they're, they're not so obvious. And so that, I think that's why people think that, you know, you're either a great writer or you aren't. Whereas actually, you know, everybody can become a lot better at writing. They just have to understand the issues with their current writing and then know how to address them. And that's what we're trying to help uh, help you with. Yeah. Uh, so there's all kinds of useful information here. For instance, sentence length. Uh, for me, this is a really interesting one because this immediately shows your writing in a different uh, dynamic. You know, often, if you see a piece of writing that, that 
feels like really hard to understand, you'll notice that there's lots of really long sentences in a row. Uh, or if it feels dull, you'll see lots of sentences about the same length in a row. It creates this kind of monotony for the reader that is very hard to, to see. Um, it just comes about from similar syntactical structures being used repeatedly in, in a section, uh, giving a, same, a similar sort of sentence length. So it really allows you to dig into your writing and see what might be causing issues with it. Um, and of course, you can print it all out if you want to go into more depth. Um, a lot of people like to, to either, you know, aim pin it up and save it as a PDF so that they've got it to refer to later on um, or to print it up, print it out. Uh, and then that gives you kind of a benchmark and then it's nice to go back at the end and compare your end version with the beginning so that you can see how much you've improved. Yeah, one of the one of the guys in our Facebook group showed printed out his initial stats and then after two weeks of like full time editing of his novel printed them out again and it was like a completely different book. It's great when you can see that growth and see that change. So based on, so there's a good question here, Joe says, based on what we're looking at here and and the goals at the top, what, where would you focus? Ah, well, that's a good question. Uh, and I kind of answered it before by saying I'd start at the top and work down. So I would start with the grammar, style and spelling. So that would be just going through and accepting uh, everything that I think I should or ignoring it if I don't. Um, and that would get my score up high into the green. Uh, and then I would go down and look at the glue index here um, and I would click it, uh, which uh, just runs the report. So all of the reports are along here. Uh, this just runs the particular report for a goal. As in this case, the sticky sentences report, I could have just run it from here. Um, and you can see that it's just highlighted a bunch of sentences that it sees as sticky. Um, and what do I mean by sticky sentence? A sticky sentence is one that has a high percentage of glue words, hence the high glue index. And you can see that. Uh, and glue words are just those nothing words like in and on the of, like just the scaffolding of your sentence compared to the working words, which are the ones that have the actual true meaning in your sentence. So you can get rid of most of the glue words and you could probably still understand your sentence. And the sentence that are most clear have a much higher percentage percentage overall of like working words compared to glue words um, those have all been reduced and everything is more concise so this is a really I find for my own writing this is a great one for pointing out those sentences where I've tried to pack in a bunch of points and they meander around a bit and you get to the end and you go wait what and you have to go back and read it again to try and figure out what I'm trying to say this is what a lot of my sentences are like less these days but but it, that's my sort of writer's bad habit. Um, and so this is just a good way to flag them so that I can go and rewrite them. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because various people have different approaches for fixing sticky sentences. Uh, I just like to cut words. Uh, I think other people like to start again with just the working words and then see what's the minimum number of extra words that I can add. Um, so there's kind of two different ways to approach it. And I, actually, I like the cutting because I often find you can actually just cut whole sections of the sentence, which just waffle. Um, and I think people's tendency is just to waffle when they're talking because often <laughs> you're, you're waiting for your, your like brain to catch up with your mouth. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's the problem, right? And so you add in all of these extra filler words, the glue words, and the, you know, most people spend a lot more time or have spent a lot more time in their life talking than they have writing. So your natural tendency is to then write in the same way that you talk, but you're, you've become so used to using these glue words and these filler words when you talk so that you have time to think that you just do it naturally, even when you don't need that time, right? And writing is a time when you, you know, you have all of the time that you need to write these things down. So you can actually uh, cut the words. And I, think, I can't remember who it was, but there's a famous quote about, I'm, I apologize for uh, sending you such a long letter because I didn't have time to write a shorter one. 
Uh, and that's what they're talking about is that you know, it's that extra time to then cut away all of the unnecessary words that are getting in the way of your meaning, getting in, slowing your reader down uh, and annoying your reader. Um, yeah, so if you click through, there's the yellow eye again, that's your information. If you click through there, there's an article that has like six different things that you can look at to reduce um, glue words. And it says, these are the things that you might want to look for. You've packed in too many points or you've put the back of your sentence first or you've, so this is sort of explaining what it all is. It's just some of the glue words and then lots of examples to help you understand what a more clear sentence looks like. So have you made it needlessly complex? Have you backloaded your sentences? Have you included non-essential information? Often you find that's Chris's that he just fills it up with all sorts of stuff that doesn't actually matter and then goes back and gets rid of all of that stuff. Like my brain full of stuff that doesn't matter. <laughs> so so, yeah, so this is a good example of all of the extra information you can find on the website to help you uh, learn. To build your skills and help you learn what to look for when you're writing and when you're editing your own work. I mean, ideally, we would teach this software would teach you all the things that you need to know, and you we'd make ourselves redundant. But actually, even best selling authors still make a lot of the same mistakes, and especially if you're in in um, creative mode, and you just want to get your ideas out and get your ideas down and get that first draft complete. It's totally fine to drop a cliche. It's totally fine to you know have a long rambling sentence as long as you're willing to go back afterwards and and fix it up. And there's so much magic in the editing and revision phase where you can take a scene and just really polish it and shine it and make every sentence clean and clear and powerful. Um, and so if you if we are writing in the first place and you get to end up with a lot of a lot of scores and a lot of areas that it needs work, then great. That just gives you lots of opportunity to make it better. Yeah, I, I always think it's like building uh, a building, right, is you wouldn't build a building by just bringing in one brick at a time and making sure that it's perfectly aligned and then going back and getting another brick and then right, you get all of the bricks that you need, you drive them to the building site, you plunk them in a big pile, right, and then you use all of those bricks to build your house. And the, the writing phase for me is that getting all of your raw materials together in one place uh, right, which is all of your ideas, and it doesn't really matter how perfect they are, they're just kind of plonked there, right, and then the editing phase is when you take all of those raw materials and you craft them into a beautiful building or a castle or a whatever you want to call it. Um, so they are very different phases, and that's what, you know, as Lisa was saying, a lot of professional writers and a lot of professional editors use Pro Writing Aid because it makes that whole process of taking your big lump of ideas and turning it into a polished manuscript so much easier and so much faster. Um, okay, there's there's quite a few people who are asking, we'll go and do a couple of reports in a minute, but there's I've got a lot of questions about the difference between premium and free. So what mm -hmm. you're seeing here, um, what's the difference between free users and premium users? Uh, so the main difference between premium and free is the amount of text that you can analyze. Uh, so in the free version, all of the reports uh, are limited to 500 words, uh, and the which you know, works absolutely fine for some people, and some people like to go through in smaller chunks. Um, in premium, you have unlimited. Um, there's various other things, like uh, for instance, you can create your own style rules in here, or like a style guide. So you know, if you have certain rules that work, you know, about things you can and can't say, you know, how you spell your company name, you can create rules for that. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you have certain, like me, I always say it's really interesting uh, and I've set up a rule that deliberately highlights when I say it's really interesting. Uh, <laughs> so that it says, no, Chris, it's not really very interesting at all. Try using something else. Um, you can create all of those rules, um, and there, there's a limit, I think, of five of those um, for non-premium users, but premium users have uh, more than you could probably ever use. Um, but what are the other thing that, well, I mean, there's a few more things that you get, but the other, the reason a lot 
lot of people go premium is to access our integration. So if you if you're a free user, you've got access to all, all the reports in this web editor. But you can also download the Word integration, which is what a lot of people use. And a lot of we're the only um, editing software out there that has a Scrivener integration. And I know there's a lot of you here that that use Scrivener. So this is what the Word integration looks like. Yep, so you can see again, uh, there's a toolbar up here with all of your favorite reports. Uh, then you've got your goals and your grammar and style here. That At the top of that is where you can choose um, your general fiction or other styles, right? Yep. Yeah, okay, that was one of the questions. Okay, um, and then, so how would they work with Scrivener? There's a couple of people here that are asking about Scrivener. Uh, so for Scrivener, because obviously Scrivener is quite complicated, uh, we can't actually integrate directly with it, but we've got our desktop app. Uh, so you can download this app and install it, uh, and then it opens up Scrivener project. So you just go file, open, uh, file, and choose your Scrivener project. Here I've opened one up, and you can see you get this directory structure, which is exactly the same as in uh, your Scrivener project. You can navigate it and open the different bits. Uh, if I turn on my real-time checking, uh, I'll get all of the highlights in here. Uh, and you can even check whole kind of sections at the same time uh, by running different reports. Uh, so like yeah, section. somebody was saying, is there a way to select multiple files at once so you can see a summary report for the entire Scrivener uh, of just the chapter you can working. run it on like a, a, fo a folder and all of its uh, sub items. Can you do it on the whole thing if you click on draft at the top? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's <clears throat> how you do that. That's, that's yeah, cool. and that's a good point actually because I think that goes to how much text should I run it on at one time, which is obviously a very Common yeah, question. Here you know, we get a lot of people say saying, uh, oh, you know, I'm, I'm running it on my 300,000 word novel, uh, and it's a bit slow. Uh, that's rubbish. Uh, and we <laughs> <laughs> we say, well, actually, you know, are you realistically going to uh, run it on? Well, edit a 300,000 word novel in one sitting, uh, and the answer is probably no. Um, there are some reports which are designed to run on your whole novel and actually they run pretty quickly like the uh, consistency report um, but generally speaking when you're editing you're going to be editing you know, a few pages you know, at a time chapter. a chapter a couple of chapters at a time um, and from a kind of iterative perspective it's best to focus on on a smaller chunk of text um, you'll get a lot more from doing that uh, so I always say just do with a chapter at a time. If you actually import a larger Word document into the web editor um, that has chapter headings that are done using the, you know, these, uh, these headings, the heading one, heading two in Word, and um, then what it will do is actually break it up into chapters for you uh, so that you can edit the individual chapters. And then when you exactly. export it, it will just puts it all back together. Okay. And so, um, maybe I'll do a quick, I'm going to do a quick poll here. Um, the, so the poll says, um, what's your favorite pro writing aid report? But actually what I want to know is which report would you like us to have a quick look at to help you understand um, what's what? So I'm just running a poll. Let us know which one you want us to talk about. And while we're waiting for that to run, um, somebody says, "Does <laughs> we were talking about this today, does your software work on a WordPerfect document? <laughs> oh, Chris, can you hear me? Yep, oh, you want me to answer? The answer is no. Uh, no, unfortunately, <laughs> um, we, we don't support WordPerfect at the time. Um, it's just not enough people out there using it, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, someone says, how do I know if I have the premium version? Uh, if you don't have the premium version, you'll see how will it look different. Uh, well, every time you run a report, there'll be something at the top saying this was limited to 500 words. 
Um, but going back to WordPerfect, I think with, well, WordPerfect and Mac Pages as well. Uh, Mac Pages, the Apple won't tell anybody what the file format is, so no other software can support it. And they don't support plugins, so we can't build a plugin for it. Uh, but you can export it, well, you can import pages documents into our web editor and edit them. Um, and I think with WordPerfect, it, we support .docx files, uh, which is pretty standard format that WordPerfect works with in imports and exports, exports. So if you do use WordPerfect, you can import your documents into our web editor and work on them and then export them again. So we just don't have an integration directly into it. And I don't actually think that WordPerfect uh, supports add-ins, but I don't hold me to that. <laughs> okay, uh, the voting is in. Um, let's, the top report is the style report, which I think is probably our most popular report. Um, and then readability and dialogue have come in second. Excellent. Okay, uh, well, let me start with the style report then. Uh, yeah, so style again uh, is obviously very popular. Uh, a lot of the enhancements in here, so all of these readability enhancements are the uh, the rules that we've built um, with our copy editing team, who have taken all of the things that they would generally highlight in a document and they've turned those into to rules um, that then match and make the suggestions for you. I think some people say, oh, well, why, that's why I have a copy editor, so I don't have to do that. Um, but actually, a lot of copy editors suggest to their clients to use ProWriting Aid before they send it to them, um, because you'll get a lot more value from your copy editor uh, if you do that. Uh, yeah, so imagine the scenario where you just sent your copy editor a document and you hadn't even spell checked it, and they were having to fix hundreds of spelling mistakes. Your copy editor they only have a, a specific amount of time that they can spend on your document. So if you just send them something with spelling mistakes, they, they're going to spend that whole time fixing the spelling mistakes and they're not actually going to add value. Um, and it's similar with style issues, right? If you fix all of those, then your copy editor can really focus on the, the you know, more important things, the harder things to do and the things that they've trained to do and actually the things that they enjoy doing more. Um, so you'll get a lot more value from them by using ProWriting Aid beforehand. Um, and if you don't have a copy editor, then <coughs> you, you at least get the stage of, uh, I've got all of the kind of quick wins that a copy editor would give me. Um, yeah, so Melin, uh, really, you are the, the writer and you are the best person to do a really strong, thorough self-edit to make sure that what is in your head is going from your head into the minds of readers with the fewest bumps along the way. Um, and we, we, we did an interview with a bunch of uh, best-selling uh, authors last week, and Steve Barry just kept lamenting the lost art of the self-edit and how great it is for writers to go back and really like spend time trying to make things brilliant and amazing. And so that what, before they submit anything to an editor or to an agent or to a publishing company or anything, you know, taking the time to do that magical art of improving every little thing is, is essential. And I couldn't agree more. Yes. And that, that's what we're here to help with. Right. Um, but I think a lot of people don't do it because they don't know necessarily where to start. And that's again what we're trying to do right we're trying to show you where to start what to improve and also more importantly why to improve it and i think that's one of the kind of key bits of feedback we get from people is that they really learn how to become better writers from using the tool um, and obviously as you learn then your first draft becomes better and the amount of time that you have to then spend editing becomes less um, yeah, I think you'll always have to do an edit and every writer you know, who gets published, whether it's in an, a newspaper or a magazine or a, a novel, does a separate editing phase uh, on their writing. Um, yeah, Ian it, Rankin it, said that he goes through four full drafts before he even lets his wife read it. That's what he was <laughs> saying last week. 
And, and his wife is when it's ready for his wife, that's when he knows it's ready. And then she makes a ton of changes and fixes things and everything. And, you know, he's sold 30 million books and he still goes through three or four before his wife gets it. So nobody gets it right the first time. Yeah. I think it's amazing how many writers there are that are like husband and wife team where one of them is the famous one uh, as the writer and the other is, is completely <laughs> unknown, but is probably as instrumental in the process uh, as the other one because yeah. they're doing the the actual editing and feedback. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's often you know why <clears throat> pet partners, I think in a relationship you need one person who kind of thinks bigger picture and one person who thinks kind of more details right and that, there's almost like the two different sides of of writing um and i think that's why some writers really in, enjoy the kind of the actual writing bit and others really enjoy the editing bit and depending on kind of your personality type and often you have somebody who has that other skill that you can use uh, as a, a sounding board and a, to help you uh, and if not, you've got pre writing in. Yeah, exactly. Um, how does a grammar check um, work with dialogue? Uh, in what way? Well, if you're writing, um, what's the best way to think about it if you're writing characters that would speak in a, in a way that may not be grammatically correct? Uh, well, the... Grammar check. I, I assume that's what the question is. I apologize if I yeah. got that question wrong. Uh, the grammar check, I think, breaks it down into grammar check, grammar in dialogue and not. Um, but what you can often do is you can, if you have certain grammatical ticks of a character, you can disable rules. Um, so you can disable certain grammar checking. Uh, and obviously, you can ignore them as well. It is very difficult because obviously you want to find grammar mistakes in some dialogue, but sometimes you don't want to find it in other dialogue. Um, there is. Well, and I just reason. think it's important to not get too hung up on the scores. If you're writing a character that speaks in a way that includes a lot of grammar mistakes and and um, uncommon usage and that sort of thing, and your score stays low, then then you know that that's why. Um, and you're the writer, this is a tool for you. This isn't a teacher grading your reports and making sure you get to 100%. You have to remember that this is a tool for you to make your work better. And at the end of the day, you're the writer, you make the decisions. If you make the decision to include tons of grammar mistakes in the dialogue of your characters, great, that's your decision, go for it. Keep your score low. And actually that might show you that you've, you've, you've got the tone of voice right. Yeah, but you can always ignore them and then they'll go out with the score. Yeah, true. What next, Lisa? <laughs> Nick doesn't know what waffle we were. Means. We've gone so off piste. Oh, yeah, we're on I know, the I know. Report. For all the non British people out here, I'm Canadian. And if you in here in the UK, if you waffle on about something, that means that you're just like adding loads of nonsense and being indirect in your speaking. That's a very oh. British thing, Chris. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> no. Nice. <laughs> in Canada, a waffle is something you eat. Yeah. The best part of life, though. Nice. Uh... Um, okay. Anything else you want to talk about there in the where I'm, I'm aware that we've only got 10 minutes left and we've got another session immediately after this. So we have to end bang on time. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's various things in the Star Report. I think adverbs are really important for a lot of writers. Again, this is something that I think you naturally add to your writing adverbs, because when you're in the flow of writing, you think of a verb, and then you think, you think oh, I want to add some nuance to my verb, um, so I will add an adverb. And But when you go through an edit, you can replace that with a stronger verb. So an example might be, you know, I write, he walked quickly across the room, or walked across the room quickly. And when I'm editing, I say, actually, he rushed, or he hurried, or he careened, or charged, or shot across the room, mm -hmm. right? It, again, you know, you're writing, it's the flow, you just want to get the idea down. 
walked quickly gets the idea down, but it's not going to be the most compelling idea for the reader. Uh, so we go through and we show you all of the adverbs. Um, and actually, we break it down into good adverbs and bad adverbs. Um, a lot of programs will just show you all the adverbs, um, but that will give you a lot of false positives. Um, show you actually the, the most important ones to change. Um, what else? Um, yeah, things like emotion tells. I think Lisa alluded to this earlier where she said uh, something about, what did you say? Uh, telling somebody you loved them or something. Yeah, instead of saying that your character felt love towards someone, you can show them gazing lovingly or you can yeah. show that emotion and it hits your reader on a more emotional level and it'll just have more of an impact as opposed to knowing intellectually that your character is feeling love or attraction or whatever it is in your romance that's, that's exactly. happening. In England, love is making somebody a cup of tea. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, we still have nearly 50 questions here. Um, can you show the Chrome extension quickly? I've got a few people asking about that. Yeah, I apologize so, uh, that I'm not getting to, through all these questions. This little icon up here is because I've got the Chrome extension installed. Uh, if I right click on here, I can see, so in the, you can just search for pre-writing a Chrome extension or Edge or Safari or Firefox, uh, and you'll get the extension so you can see 4.9 stars, you can read all the reviews here and you can install it here and then it it works wherever you're writing, virtually everywhere. Um, we're trying to make it work everywhere that doesn't. Uh, so for instance, uh, you can tweet uh, and uh, write. And you get this little icon here and then it'll get highlights. Uh, and you can correct it in there um you can so also click the on... same that you would see in the main document um just the real yeah, you time can also click on this little icon here and it'll bring up the thing in the main editor with all of your other reports so you get access basically wherever you're writing in the browser um it also plugs nicely into google docs uh so uh you get this little icon down here in the bottom right uh uh, so you get all the real-time checking. Uh, so I've got some random rules that I am put on. Uh, and then we actually have an add-on as well that you can install. There's add-on menu, uh, choose get add-ons. And this will add, allow you to use all of the... Uh, so you can see again, you just click on here and install it. Um, this will allow you to use all of the reports within Google Docs. I mean, there's extensions also for Firefox and Edge and Safari. Mm -hmm. um, okay, great. So that's the best way to use, use it in Google Docs. Um, if anyone has any questions after this, I'm going to drop the link to our Facebook group. We've got, we have a really great Facebook group where we have tons of users who love answering questions. And then there's four or five of us, of, from providing and staff, including me and Chris, um, who answer all kinds of questions in there. So you may find that if you've got questions, they've already been answered in there. Um, and if not, just drop a link in our support team and, and all of us will be there to help. So I'm just gonna drop that right now. Okay. Oh, hang on. I think I've just said that to myself. <laughs> Okay, there, I've dropped it. Um, so that's a good place to, to ask all of your questions. Um, and like I said, on our YouTube channel, which again, I will drop, um, there's videos there for everything that you can think of. And we're adding more all the time just to help people get up and running. And we know that sometimes it's coming into this, to the web editor, it can be a bit overwhelming. So we try as much as possible to help people through all of that. And yeah, there's this yes. handy learn button, which takes you to the blog. We've got a grammar guide. Uh, Lisa and her team have put together a huge number of amazing webinars. You can see this one, obviously the <laughs> most important, but uh, yeah, there's uh, some really, really interesting ones. We do regular ones on uh, creating clarity, 
different topics uh, of creative writing, business writing, academic writing. Um, they're all free, um, so just go in and sign up for them. Um, you can also see there's a extensive catalog of um, back episodes, old episodes. Back episodes, yeah. I mean, I think we've done over a hundred since we only started doing these sort of live webinar trainings um, at the very beginning of last year when lockdown sort of happened. And now we've got a back catalog of like nearly a hundred um, training videos in there. So there's something for almost everybody. And then we we also do sort of genre-based summit. So a couple of weeks ago, we did one on crime for specifically for crime writers. Um, and before that, we did one specifically for fantasy writers. Um, so make sure that you're signed up to our newsletter so you don't miss um, any announcements around that. All right, three minutes left. I apologize that there are still so many questions there. Um, I'm just trying to choose the ones that are going to mean the most to as many people. I've done that one. Um, so, so plagiarism checker. What's the source material for the plagiarism checker? That's a good quick one. Uh, so we use a like a wide variety, anything on the web, and uh, then a wide variety of other books and materials. Thousands of books, thousands yeah. of web addresses. Yeah. Billions. Um, is, billions. Bill, is it billions? Great. Um, Nick says, is there any way to add your favorite author to the list in the settings? Uh, send us a message and yeah. uh, we'll see. People uh, have been requesting and we, we keep adding new people all the time. So we've just added, um, we've just uh, added about 10 over the last few weeks. And then we've, I think we, there's another 20 authors that are in the works right now. So if there's something you're desperate to have, um, send us a note or drop it in the Facebook group as well. And we'll, we'll see if we can add them there. And with that, I think we have to finish up. I apologize for everybody who asked a question that I didn't get to, um, but I hope you will find what you need on the YouTube channel, or if not, send us an email. We've got, well, there's like six amazing people that run our support team now. Um, and they love helping everybody get up and running and figure out how to get the best out of this program. So send us a message if you need to have a look at the YouTube channel and, and come and see us again for another event in the future. Chris, thanks for letting us ask you all the questions and pick your brain. No, it's been fun. See you next time. See you next time, everybody. Bye. Bye.